I want to go back to something you alluded to when you were talking about the Haitian Revolution um, or the Haitian Revolution and the French Revolution. So, you know, as we know, the principles of the Enlightenment very heavily influenced the French revolutionaries. And as you mentioned, you can see that sort of being pulled through to the Haitian Revolution. Um, I kind of feel like today, especially in the U.S. on the left, the Enlightenment has kind of fallen out of favor, right? Uh, and you you had sort of mentioned this or alluded to this as well. Um, I think there's a conception among some people that, you know, Enlightenment principles or Enlightenment values are somehow um, Eurocentric or non-universal. Or perhaps I should say that the very Enlightenment concept of universality is something that a lot of people on the left in the U.S. now try to push against. So I you know, because we are talking about the French Revolution and the Enlightenment, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why the left today should embrace the Enlightenment or, or what is it that we can take from the Enlightenment? Uh, I know, of course, in, thanks very much for this question. I know in detail this line of argumentation. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem is identity politics for me here. And of course, I have nothing against the identity politics in the sense of every group should be allowed or even solicited to retain, assert its identity. Incidentally, in the mid 1920s, till the Stalinist term, Soviet Union practiced this type of identity politics in Ukraine. I read now a right-wing historical overview of the development of Ukraine. Do you know that till October Revolution, Ukrainians were not allowed to use the everyday level to practice the Ukrainian language. It was just Russian. Ukraine developed its grammar, dictionaries. Ukrainian became a literary language during the 1920s. So they consciously propose these identities. The problem I see is somewhere where, somewhere else. And as I did it, I think already I forgot where in a text, the problem with identity politics for me is that it implies a kind of a horizontal image of social antagonisms. I'm here, you are there, we should tolerate each other, it should be allowed to, be, to build its identity and so on and so on. And you can see the catastrophe of this the moment you apply it to class struggle. Now comes my provocation. Uh, the movie which got, which triumphed at Oscars, this year, uh, Nomadland. It's honest, nice, liberal, yeah, but I think it's a wrong step towards what I'm tempted to call classism in the sense of class identity politics. The thesis is implicit, at least the way I experience the movie. Look, even those poorest workers who cannot even afford a home, permanent home, who had to drive around searching for job and so on, even they have their own cultural identity, even they have their own way of life with small rituals, solidarity, and so on and so on. I don't buy this. I think that the problem of this type of nomadic proletarians is not, cannot be solved in this sense that you provide a proper cultural identity for them, but that you demonstrate precisely that their situation is so tragic that they cannot reach a full satisfactory self-identity. As Marx put it about proletariat, their identity is self-contradicting. They, they cannot achieve that. Incidentally, in the same way, maybe I will even now write a, a, a new text criticizing this new woke Hollywood, politically correct Hollywood movies, which I think are very dangerous. Like, I didn't see it, I read about it. Luca, this new Disney cartoon about a boy from the sea of Italian coast, sea monster who can adopt human image and then becomes friendly with, I think, a gay boy 
ordinary Italian men, and they overcome the barriers, develop friendship, and so on, and so on. We see, of course, this is meant to be as a parable for parable for every hatred of the otherness, LGBT uh, uh, immigrants, and so on, and so on. But I'm always very suspicious when a whole set of social contradictions, like why are immigrants coming here? What are the social antagonism among the immigrants? What are we doing wrong with the immigrants? Why can't we deal with the problem of immigrants just in this pure humanitarian way? Oh, there are poor people, we are humans, let's help them, and so on and so on. No, the way to really help them is to question our politics of colonialism. Look at all these critical points. Uh, 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 refugees, uh, immigrants from Africa, not to mention uh, ISIS, Syrian civil war, and so on and so on. I wrote a short text apropos Donald Rumsfeld, where I claim, my God, Rumsfeld was the main creator of ISIS in the sense that it's this catastrophic politics in Iraq, Syria, and so on, which created ISIS. Changes had to happen at this level. So you know how far I'm ready to go here. Now, this will be a problematic part. But please take me seriously. I don't trust humanitarians who say, but immigrants are suffering so much, we should help them. No, I would much more trust a slightly conservative guy who says, immigrants are annoying me. They are too different. I don't want them here. But I want to be honest. They live in a shitty place there. So let's stop what we are doing economically, politically, so that they will be able to have normal life there. The moment the problem is put in the terms of uh, humanitarianism, are we good enough to help them and so on, something is terribly wrong. Again, the problem is the global international situation. The problem is not, oh my God, there are immigrants on our border, should we allow them in or not? Of course we should allow them to avoid a misunderstanding much more than we do. But this is not the solution. And at this level, again, I'm already for years ago suspicious of this certain kind of identity politics. You know what is my primordial experience here? I remember I'm old enough before Mandela and ANC took over, the last 20 years of apartheid rule in South Africa. You know that apartheid ideology was absolute identity politics. Their argument, I read some of their text, against simply giving the blacks right to vote was, my God, but look, they have wonderful, authentic, ancient culture. If we give them the right to vote, they will just became alienated consumerists like us, and so on and so on. Here, I love my friends from these minorities, whose answer is not a hypocritical one, but a wonderfully open, us, open one. Yes, please, why not? Let us, uh, allow us please to experience a little bit of your corrupted welfare state alienation and so on. You know, there is so much, there is so much uh, hypocrisy here. So that's my worry, that uh, how to really solve the problems. And it's not just uh, um, at a moral level, it's a question of survival for all of us. If things that are now happening in, still, in the Middle East, and other parts, Guatemala, parts of Africa, and so on. If this is not resolved there, then this situation of allowing a certain amount of them to come, I'm not talking from my perspective, to Western Europe will just breed hatred here, and even more crucial, we are not 
receiving here the true victims. It's good to see at the statistics. Average immigrant, apart from a minor number, are those who are aggressive, strong enough to pay all the bribes and so on. The truly poor remain there in terrible conditions. I think, again, we should move to this level of seeing the global problem, seeing where are the roots of the problem. If not, we are lost. And so the, you know, the spirit of the French Revolution and I think the Enlightenment in general was kind of infused with this hope um, and hope and progress for the future. And I think on the left, especially in academia, there are, there are certain trends such as like Afro-pessimism or, or postmodernism that don't have the same kind of hope. And, you know, a lot of revolutions of the late 18th, early 19th century were kind of fueled by these common, um, you know, themes, grievances, social forces. Do you see any prospects for revolutions in the 21st century? And if so, you know, what factors do you think will fuel them? It's very risky, this terrain, we don't know right. not, but I, I think that, yes, you know, history is full of miracles in a good sense. Like, who would have even imagined 20, 25 years ago, something like what happened, okay, we know how it finished then, but nonetheless, something like Syriza in Greece. Mm -hmm. The literally majority of the population mobilized at this level and so on and so on. And uh, so I cannot be precise about what form some, let's call it revolution or upheaval, strong social upheaval will take. I just... Uh, want to emphasize one thing which seems to me crucial. I've written about it a couple of times. Till now, the predominant form of protests in uh, third world and uh, Eastern European post-communist countries was what Habermas, in a very unfortunate term of the praise, called Nachholende Revolution catch up revolution. Like, we in the developed Western Europe already have it. You are just trying to catch up with us. And that's all you can do. Habermas went so far here that he even attacked some East German dissidents, like Christa Wolf, the writer, and so on, who claimed, but maybe, in spite of all uh, communist failures, there were some forms of minimal social solidarity and so on that had some kind of a lesson which could remain operative and help us even if or when we integrate the West. Habermas was in panic about this, pro pro uh, about this prospect. For him, no, 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 this was the danger then of new totalitarianism and so on and so on. But I think these skeptics, by skeptics I mean people who saw that what happened after the fall of really existing socialism is not simply we want to catch up with the West. Why? Because first, I remember from my youth, I was part of those phenomena, especially my links with Poland. I knew Adam Michnik and so on. And they all told me, you know, at the beginning, Solidarność was a workers' committee. It had a much stronger workers uh, uh, and even modern pop culture and so on. Turn. Uh, the, the church took over later. So basically, if you look closely at what was moving, even the majority of solidarity, it was not simply capitalism. It was an open society where there is a freedom of expression uh, and basic social safety, welfare, some welfare guaranteed and so on. It was much closer to what was the best in the official ideology itself. And the sad paradox is that since then neoliberal takeover of post-European 
East, post, sorry, post communist East European countries. When this happened, then this betrayed socialist legacy returned in the guise of its opposite as this uh, new right wing uh, populism, which, and that's the saddest thing, which still has a much stronger social note than pro-Western market liberals and so on. Look at Poland. Yes, I hate them, this Kaczynski's party, uh, law and justice. <coughs> but you know what they did? It's horrible, horrible from the perspective of freedom-loving liberals. They raised uh, average salary. They made uh, conditions for retirement much better, Lo stu uh, uh, student loans, much, and so on and so on. They did a whole series of measures for ordinary people, which the ruling liberal, even left liberal business elite was not ready to do. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that aren't we getting now something similar even in the West? The revolt we are getting now there. Look at uh, uh, the yellow vests in France. Okay, they are mixed. I don't totally support them. But the important thing is this one. They are not no longer a catch-up demand. It's not no, we want true parliamentary democracy. They have, a, a, they articulate a discontent precisely in this Fukuyama's world of, uh, of uh, 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 capitalist liberal democracy and so on and so on. So in the East and in the West, we have a certain amount, amount of critical energy which cannot be properly articulated more and more in the existing parliamentary system. And again, the right-wing populists manipulate with this in a very astute way. And my formula is the only way, even for the honest liberals, to catch ground again is to move to the left. I think that's a pretty pretty good note to end on. Uh, it looks like we are coming up on the hour. So I want to thank you, Schlavoy, for being here. Again, we will air this on Bastille Day. So happy Bastille Day to you and to all the viewers. I'm very grateful to all of you for being able to talk here. You know why? If me, you allow me a brief uh, conclusion. Because I... Always, when I mention Jacobins and so on, even those who are sympathetic to me, they take this as a kind of eccentricity, you know. Ooh, you are playing a postmodern intellectual game or whatever. But listen, I now I even don't want to mention Marxism too much. I simply tell them, look at Seattle uh, and... Uh, no, I don't like Seattle. My favorite cities there are Vancouver, although... <laughs> The center, the island, is now occupied by the Far East rich people. They will have to do something. Uh, no, I, I have nothing against people from the East to coming, but not just the rich people from there. And Portland, you know why I like Portland? It still has, I think, the best bookstore in the United States. Mm. Four or five yes. connected, no? So uh, what I'm saying is that just look, just Look at it with some kind of a remainder of a healthy common sense. When you have these effects of global warming, pandemic is going on and so on and so on. It's stupid to say, let's leave the conclusion to the market. The situation is too much an emergency state. It's not, I don't like the metaphor of war here. But it is some kind of a warlike emergency state. And let me give a metaphor which I hope all rough militarists will like. You are attacked by an enemy and you need planes and tanks. And if you don't say, okay, let's, let's address the market, let's, you know, blah, blah. No, you have to organize it in a voluntarist way immediately. 
we need 10,000 tanks, we need uh, bombers, and so on. And just saying that the same thing is here, that uh, voluntarism is needed. Again, egalitarianism, not in this abstract sense, everybody the same salary, but it is simple sense of never should we in the pandemic, for example, sacrifice one part of the world of one part of our own population. It doesn't work. Healthcare simply has to be universal. Not to mention the new crisis. We will need some transnational organizations with enough force to even enforce solutions. I think it's totally realistic if these trends of extreme heat drought in some places will go on to somehow execute large movements, tens of millions, even more of the population. And we cannot afford today to do this through war as it was done in the past. These are for me simply things of common sense survival. So my concluding formula is that as we know many things, but the most surprising thing is our self-imposed blindness, how many things we refuse to know. We simply act as if, you know, oh, the pandemic will be over, or oh, so what if some oysters are frying uh, in the ocean uh, near Vancouver, and so on and so on. But it's clear that these phenomena are just, are just popping up here and there, and they are gradually combining in a more global change of balance like what gives me panic is that it's not just there vancouver did you read what is happening now in those places which were usually proclaimed the coldest places in the earth in northern siberia they also are at 35 degrees now mm. we have to get ready i'm not saying panic i'm saying getting ready for large movement of the population emergency measures and so on and so on and I think here, communism, some form of communism will be necessary. Capitalism cannot confront these problems.